Welcome to a special interview edition of Adult Music. A first for us. We're pretty excited about it. That's right. Uh, we recently spoke to jazz pianist and organist Mike Ladon about his new release, It's All Your Fault, on Savant Records featuring the Groover Quartet and a big band. Yeah, it's an album we talked about on the previous podcast. You can check that out as well. This is an awesome album. It's going to put you in a good mood. It's available on CD and all major streaming platforms. And it's an awesome interview, too. Yes, he gave us some real insights into lots of things. Uh, we started talking to him about some of his earlier recordings and how he came to concentrate on the Hammond B3 and develop his own unique style on the organ. And then he took us track by track through the new album with insights into its inspiration and finally gave us some thoughts on uh, the joy of swing because swing is a joy is it not we should all be listening to it all the time especially now so please relax and enjoy the interview all right we're pleased to be joined by the great mike ladon pianist organist and incredible jazz man mike thanks for taking the time to be with us this evening well, thanks for having me. Great to be here. It's our pleasure. Uh, we're really excited about uh, your new release, and I've got a lot of questions about that. Uh, first of all, I first came to know you a long time ago. I was a trumpet player, studied trumpet in when I was young in university, and, and uh, my favorite player, still one of my favorites now, is Tom Harrell. And um, mm. after I had got all of his recordings I could get, I started looking for all the recordings recordings that he had played as a sideman on and then mm -hmm. i found you know he was on i think it was your first release as a leader yeah. uh, about time first in 1988 two. my first two actually uh, and the second one too was called the feeling of jazz right so that's the first time i heard you and i remembered your name and i had picked up another disc um uh, a few years later uh the baritone uh, gary smile and saxophone mosaic and that's oh, yeah. all there's that same uh, piano player again. <laughs> then a, a few years later, I discovered uh, Jim Rotundi, and uh, who I'm still amazed that why isn't he more you know better known because he's such an amazing player. And yeah. um, then I heard on uh, Then and Now, I think that was 1999. Oh wow, yeah, right. Yeah. And right. Um, so my introduction was you know to you was on those piano recordings, and um, so I. You know, I knew your name from that time, and then, then since the early two thousands, you've done a lot of uh, recordings on organ uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Groover Quartet. Was the first one "Smoking Out Loud" two thousand four? Yeah, right. Yeah, that was the first one. And so there's a whole series on fire. In the same year, you did one. I think it's the quartet plus Jim Rotundi. Uh, he was the leader blues for Brother Ray. Oh yeah, that was that, that was that's a great right. recording. Yeah, and then the Groover. Keep the Faith, uh, I Love Music, All Right, uh, That Feeling, From the Heart. Those are all just awesome. <laughs> They're uh, all really good albums. <laughs> organ recordings. And I, I've heard you talk in other interviews about how you got started on an organ playing in your father's music store. And uh, <laughs> you, you were doing you know blues and R&B music in bands when you were a teenager. And yep. um, But then, like, when I first, impression of you was as, you know, you know a real modern pianist uh, i'm curious what made you uh focus on uh suddenly in the 2000s it seems like like there was a whole rush of organ things uh right that you recorded well something um funny thing i, I so one of my favorite organ players believe it or not who was a big influence on me was charles erland and charles erland was the favorite of this gentleman who owns a club here named smoke and so he used to have in fact i lent smoke my Hammond. I had a Hammond. I bought another Hammond in uh, in New when I was in New York City. So I had sold my Hammond when I was in college because I thought I was done with. I was I was Mr. Bud Powell now. I wasn't, you know, <laughs> right. Rose above the Hammond organ, and I told my parents just get rid of it. I'm not going to play it anymore. So my comeback was because of a one night where I went to. This is a side story. I went to a place called Dude's Bar with my friend Jim Snydero, who's a great alto player. He was playing with brother Jack McDuff and who had a band with horns and Joe Dukes and Dave Stryker was in it. And, um, you know, Jim said, why don't you come listen? I know you used to play organ. Maybe you'd want to play a tune. And I said, no, never, never playing a tune in front of Jack McDuff and played in years. But sure enough, Jack came over to me in the break and he said, I hear you play organ. I want you to hear you. Just, let's hear you just play uh, um, 
let's hear you just play a blues or something. I said, okay. So I didn't play one tune. He came over to me, was very enthusiastic, told me that I'm crazy if I don't pursue playing the organ because I sound like a real organ player. And that's something coming from him. So that did it. That just got so pumped that I went and bought another Hammond, got back in there, started playing these gigs with this guy named, have you ever heard of Percy France? I don't know if you know that name. Sounds familiar. Yeah. He used to play with, played with, he signed a couple of records with Jimmy Smith and he played with Bill Doggett, really great tenor player. And he hired me to play with him uh, at Showman's in Harlem uh, every Wednesday and I got my chops back together. Joe Dukes was the drummer. You know, it's only in New York that this happened. And so I'm doing this these gigs. And then Charles Erlen was playing, uh, uh, Paul Stash told me he wanted to start an organ night at Smoke. And so I said, well, if you're really serious, I can lend you my organ and you can just use it for free and maybe let me play there once in a while. I did that. Charles Erlen played there, Melvin Ryan, uh, Lonnie, Dr. Lonnie Smith, um, everybody played there. Big John Patton, you name it. And I played a gig there. No, I didn't play a gig there. I was just resting, you know, letting me use my organ until Charles Erlen passed away. And then uh, they had a big uh, tribute to him. And Jim Rotundi, trumpet player, just mentioned, he called me and he said, Donsky, come with me. You're going to play some organ. We're going to do a Charles Erlen thing with you. And I'm like, okay. So I went up, I played one tune. And then Paul Stash said he wanted to hire me for a series of five Tuesdays. And that turned into 20 years of Tuesday. Wow. wow. Yeah. So there you go. That's that's what got me. That's how I got back to the organ. And I, I had left it for a little while, but actually I started playing it when I was 10 years old. So, but always for fun. I didn't really, really wanted to avoid the whole pressure of, uh, you know, recording and then critics and then the whole thing that happens when you get that arena. I just wanted to have organ be my fun and the soulful thing that I did for myself. But it, it got out of the bag, and I'm glad it did, because it really uh, it really did take off. So there Do you go. feel like you're a different personality when you're playing organ than when you're on piano now, now that you've done so much on organ like that? Yeah, but similar, a lot of threads carry over. You know, I hope that I'm uh, soulful on both. Yeah, well, that's... That's one thing I really noticed because uh, 2019, you, you came back with the Piano Trio album, Partners in Time, with Christian McBride. And what right. I noticed about that is even on the, the old standards, like I, I, I listened to it and I d didn't look at the tracks and I said, hmm, what's this funky groove? <laughs> but it was my funny Valentine. <laughs> yeah, so right. It was like my funky Valentine. It was Yeah, uh, right. My funny that was Louis Nash's idea, by the way, the, uh, the drum beat. But, uh, but I liked it. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and we, I did other piano records during my tenure with the at Smoke too. But the thing that's different is I don't like to cross over the language. The language is very different on organ than on piano, and um, that's what it is. It's just like I, I realized a long time ago, actually, when I was playing Fender, some Fender Rhodes things. The problem when I first started playing Fender Rhodes was I was trying to make it be a piano, you know, and it wasn't. And then. When I started hearing Fender Rhodes as a, as, an, as a voice, I realized, oh, there it is. So easy when you just hear it as its own voice. So organ has its own voice and, and it's, its own language. And plus its own set of uh, wrinkles, you know, like you got to pull the levers out. You got to switch the sounds you're playing, the bass line you're playing, you're improvising. You're trying to be two people at once really three people because some other guy is switching all the sounds and trying to, and you you know, you're hearing these things in real time. And you're doing all these things that you don't do. You do these things kind of on piano, but with finger muscles, finger control. On organ, it's like, you know, a five-year-old could sit down and have the same sound I do on the organ when they press the key down. But the whole trick is all the manipulation of the sounds and hearing the sounds and knowing how to get to them uh, quickly. You had mentioned that, um, you went back to the organ. Right now, there are a lot of um, high-profile organists in jazz. What was the status of the organ back then? Has it changed? Well, when I was playing the organ, actually, it was before Joey DiFrancesco even ever came out with a record, you know? In fact, when he came out with his first record, that's when I got the idea. I, I called Jerry Teakins of Criss Cross, who I was recording for, and I said, why don't I make an organ record? Because I can play organ, too, you know? And it seems like people like Joey, so... They might like me, who knows, you know, and he was, and he was against it. He said he thought it would confuse people and they wouldn't know, was I a piano player? What am I, an organ player? Blah, blah, blah. So he wouldn't do it. So that, that put the organ on the shelf for me. And then I started seeing others, Larry Goldings. I mean, 
You know, I knew Larry when he didn't even know how to set up the uh, draw bars on the organ. You know, he didn't know much about the organ. He was just a, such a talented uh, musician. I think he could play, you know, a toy and play deep stuff on it. You know, so, so I mean, I used to see him playing this Korg, Korg a clone, one of the first or Hammond clones. And it sounded weird, but you know, like the sound he got was just not at all. So I just showed him like, no, you pull out these, you, here's a setting for this person. And, and then, and you know, when he, I remember when he first got his, his Leslie and I showed him how to set that up and stuff. So here I am, you know, like in the background, helping Larry out. And, uh, you know, I knew Joey was out there doing all of this stuff. At that time, they were the only two as, that I can remember. And no, well, to tell you the truth, in New York, before they came out, there was me and there was a guy named Bobby Forrester. And Bobby played with everybody. He was playing with um, Ruth Brown and uh, doing a lot. Like, he was a real, like, hardcore, you know, schlep the organ yourself. Nobody helps you. You get it in and out of the van yourself. He was one of those guys. And, and unfortunately, he died of, a, like, a heart attack. That's, that's what that'll do for you. And um, he was a great guy and a, and a great player. And, but there was just the two of us. I mean, you could ask people who know New York, the scene here. There was just me playing at Showman's. And this is before Joey ever came out, and uh, and Bobby Forrester, and then Larry Goldings happened, and Joey happened, and then some it, very slowly, like Samuel came around, and uh, there were some a few organ players starting to surface. Now it's still pretty open field, yeah, compared, yeah. compared to piano. I mean, piano there's the literally yeah. probably tens of thousands, you know. Yeah, and uh, organ you got a handful of people who are known, you know, and um, and I know them all, and and it's nice it's nice to see because you know with the organ I mean I love it and I want it to keep going and it's nice to see all the different ways people are using it now. Yeah. And everything like that, so I was um, playing some keyboard parts in a band a few years back, and I, some tunes I wanted to add organ in, and I was like I just don't have I like organ, but I don't have a concept. This was before streaming yeah. came out, and yeah. there was internet radio. There was a station called Hammond Radio, and all it did was play. Any genre that was all mixed jazz, pop, and all Hamiltons. Anything and, had a ham. Yeah, and I was listening. This is great. It's helping me think what kind of lines and things. And I heard all these songs that I remembered as a kid, and I said, wow. In the 60s and 70s, Hammond was everywhere. It was in all kinds of pop music, all kinds of jazz, uh, R&B. And you know, now in pop music, we don't even get to hear guitar much, or yeah. let alone organ. But like recently, well, just on our show in the past couple of months, we've talked about Dr. Lonnie Smith's new record. Uh, we did Brian Charette. And then this guy out of Seattle, the uh, Delvin Lamar organ trio. I don't know him. I'll oh, you got to check. Him out. No, check it That's out. a good record. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. Very extremely yeah. funky. Uh, yeah. Okay. You'd love Great. it. Yeah. Um, it's, um, you know, kind of uh, groove oriented soul jazz kind of thing. But uh, yeah. I think he has, a, you know, it's kind of this kind of hip Seattle scene. I think he's got the potential to, um, you know, draw in a younger audience who's into sort of jamming kind of things. So it seems like in uh, jazz, it's coming back. And then, of course, uh, yeah, last Del year... Delva, by the way, his name is Delvon Lamar. Delvon, Delvon, Delvon Lamar, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, mm -hmm. then there was, of course, the uh, Christian McBride and Joey DeFrancisco uh, for Jimmy West and Oliver last year, which I thought was a huge, you know, that was a really fun uh, album. That got me thinking, uh, and I know in the past, uh, well, uh, Wild Bill Davis played organ with big band, right? And then, um, yeah, he did, and he was a big band as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Jimmy Smith did uh, like Bashin with Oliver Nelson and uh, Cat, the Cat yeah. with uh, Lalo Schifrin. And uh, so I'm curious, how did you decide like it was time for you know big band with the Groove oh, Quartet? I didn't decide that. Um, what happened was there's a uh, a gentleman who has uh, who gives out grants to musicians. And he's, been, he's a fan of mine, maybe the biggest fan I have. And he called me and said he wanted me to do something with an orchestra, with the, with the organ. And I was like, well, orchestra, you know, I don't hear like strings and all of that with an organ. But big band, I love big band with organ. So that's how it came about. He said, okay, I'll give you the money for this. He gave most of the money and the record company filled in the rest. It's very expensive to do. And, uh, and we did it at Rudy Van Gelder's, the classic studio with the same organ that all those guys played on those big, the ones you just mentioned, all the, they all played that organ on those. So it was really a special event 
that day. And the band was just killer. Was like oh, yeah, you got John Faddis. I heard that right away. I was like, whoa. All the best cats trumpets. in New York were there, and a lot of my friends were there. So it was a big party. And Dennis McCrell, who I have uh, admired his arranging, he's a great drummer, but he's probably the only drummer that can arrange like he does, I think, ever in history. <laughs> so I called him because I used to play in his big band, and he wrote, he has a book the size of a telephone book of, of things that we used to rehearse. And we did some gigs, not many, but I heard his writing then, and he'd written for McCoy Tyner's big band. He's just a great writer. So, and I knew he knew the big band, like how to get this, those sounds, you know. So I called him and said, you know, you're on, write some arrangements. Here's my tunes, a couple of tunes. Here's my ideas. And we worked together on it. And, uh, and he conducted, I didn't have no pressure on me that day. He conducted, he took care of all of it. He's a really, really good, focused guy. And uh, it was just just a, one of those days out of a dream. It was a dream come true for me. Just I always wanted to do it, but I never thought I'd get to do it at Rudy's on that piano with these kind of arrangements. It was always right on the money. You know, I couldn't have made it any better than that. So, so uh, when I heard the result, it made sense. When I heard what I, what I was hearing was just what I thought I would be hearing. You know, and uh, everybody played great. And it was just one day. We did it all in one day. We had one short rehearsal beforehand just to make sure there were no mistakes in the parts. And then uh, we went right in Rudy's one day, did the whole record. Well, we went back with the quartet on the other, the second day and did a few tunes to fill out the record. Um, but that was it for the big band. It was one day. And uh, they were basically one or two takes of each wow. of each tune, which we, most of those are first takes wow. on that. Now, I just want to ask, when was this recorded? Was it before COVID or after? Before COVID. It was in February, right before uh, before COVID was really, COVID was already kicking in. Oh. In fact, I think, I think my, uh, no, no, but my gigs hadn't ended yet. So yeah, it was before. Okay. The show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't a, a session where everybody's wearing masks or anything like that. Okay. No, no. It was straight yeah. up, you know, right. blowing. Okay. Because we, um, I, we've ordered the CD, but it's not um, shipping yet in Japan. So I've been able to listen to it on uh, streaming. But of course, I don't have the album right. notes. So I'm curious. Uh, I know some of these tunes, but uh, the the title track, <laughs> It's All Your Fault. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, an yeah. original tune? It sure is. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. my original. Fantastic. I, you know, I actually, um, I have a, a real close relationship with Dr. Lonnie Smith. And whenever he would see me, first thing he would say is, it's your fault. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was his greeting. So I made that tune and the tune went, but da, da, da. So I thought, it's all your fault. Perfect. So I named it for him. And actually, I dedicated the whole record. If you get the record, you'll see uh, it's dedicated to him. The whole we, we've both got it on order. It just hasn't yeah. gotten here yeah. yet. Yeah. 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 Hmm. It, I mean, I love how it comes out screaming with the horns, but you've got that vampy groove in the beginning, right. but then it, it you know, it pushes into the swing, like, and becomes another thing. So it's like a great, that's a great uh, start on the album. And um, then then you've got uh, track two. I, I recognize that, the Grant Green tune, that beep, -da 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 -beep -da -da -da, the Matador. Yeah, Matador. And that works awesome with horns. Yeah, never been heard like that before. We've I was playing that in the organ, in, in the group of quartet for years. I always loved that tune. But, and so I told Dennis, give it a shot. And that's what he came up with. It's great. Yeah. It really works uh, well on that arrangement. And then um, you, rock, rock, rock with, with you, you. yeah. Mike, so you, yeah. You, yeah. Right. Michael Jackson, I noticed right? with the Groover Quartet, mm. over time you've picked up a lot of R&B and pop hits and then reworked them. Mm -hmm. that's, kind of our, that's kind of what I, the, the groove I got in with that because um, that's what worked best at Smoke because we were getting a lot of young kids from Columbia. It's up in that area, Columbia University area in New York City. And... I saw these young kids in there and I was thinking, they're not going to want to listen like to some obscure Larry Young tune or, you know, all the things you are. I want these kids to have fun. Like, I don't want them to come here and think it's like, oh, jazz, I don't get it. So, <laughs> so like, uh, so I started playing these tunes, but that's what Charles Erland had several, you know, I got the idea from him and then I started attacking it in my own way, you know, and finding these tunes. And I sit around and I spend a lot of time with them. You know, like I'll, I'll think of them from my childhood or I get inspiration anywhere that could be, I could be sitting on a, an airline and the Muzak will play some pop from R and B tune from the seventies. And I'll be like, ah, that's a good one. You know, I'll write it down. Yeah. And uh, so it's like, I'm going through this treasure chest of R and B tunes. And then I sit and I say, which one of these can swing and rock with you? Boy, it really swings. You know, it was no, it took me two seconds to realize that the minute I start playing, I'm like, oh my God. And when you find it, 
it's like a joyous occasion. And then I start figuring out how do I make a form so that it's like a jazz tune. And I did that one back on my first, uh, on my, like my third day, it's called The Groover. And that, that's the first date that went to number one for me. So I thought, and it was a hit. Like that tune, they played it over and over and over. And also I've done it at gigs. Like I've done it at gigs and uh, I played some Groover Quartet gigs in churches, like Baptist churches. And even though they're not supposed to, I've had the whole congregation up dancing when they heard that come on. They couldn't help it. And the, and the reverend would be saying, no, <laughs> dancing. <laughs> you know, so I thought, you know, this tune has just got a magic. And the way it swings is magical. So I had him do that one. And um, yeah, it yeah, really I mean, came out I really great. Like, I could see why you wanted to do this with Big Ben, because the, the horns really push, push that along. And also, it's something different, because on the rest of the record, I have a bass player, John Weber, with the big band because generally that's how they were done you know they didn't have the organ player play the bass but on rock with you that's me playing the bass for the whole thing with the big band and it really has some power yeah, that's great i think and I, I like uh, i really love uh peter bernstein's solo on this one it's like uh, i mean all his solos are great but this one is it, it sounds really jazzy on this tune that's you know you know everyone has an image of this tune from when they were growing up and the contrast with his solo is just yeah really nice on this one and then you've got uh, next uh the Commodore's tune, right? Still, um, hadn't heard that in a while. Lionel oh, Richie. Oh yeah, Lionel yeah. Richie. Yeah, that's um, that was actually Eric Alexander had brought that in a while ago, and uh, took me a while to figure out how to make it sound somewhat more like us and not just a cover tune. But um, I think that came out great on there. And Pete's playing some different. You know, I got Pete to play more like uh, Cornell Dupree kind of stuff on there rather than his regular stuff because he was trying to just play his jazzy stuff. And I said, you know, this needs some soul in it, man. I'm sorry. It's not going to be like a uh, touchy feely ballad. And, uh, and he did. And I love what he did. I ha actually, I have him turned up louder than the organ. <laughs> like, yeah, you really hear the guitar. You start the solo, you've got the stops changed. When you start, it's really dark and mellow. And then yeah. you really pull it out and it gets a real gospel yeah, revival yeah. kind of thing going in there. Yeah, that's, I got that stuff from um, Don Patterson, who, that's one of the, got my major influences. And boy, he could do that. And so does, so does Dr. Lonnie. And Dr. Lonnie, I think, may have gotten it from Don, too. Um, the idea of exploding during a ballad. <laughs> you know, and uh, it, is, it, it's, uh, it takes a lot of um, commitment, you know, because you, you're in this nice little groove, and you could just sit right there and be cool. But... But you have to be like, no, both feet forward, full launch pad, go. And you just, you just volume up and rip. And you know what you do? Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, uh, kind of a technique that you play. You play the foot pedals and then you have your left hand free. So you bring your left hand up over your right hand and you hold high notes, almost like a high note trumpet player would. And then you play stuff with the chords with your right hand. So you're crisscrossed. Right, your right hand's below your left, and you're playing stuff, um, um, harmonic stuff down, and also rhythms like patting down, maybe uh, little pops, pop, 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 these weird sounds that Don Patterson is the only one I know who created these these effects, and and I love them. I mean, I am a nut for all of the organ effects. I love all. Of them. I try to use all of them, and I, I got that again from Dr. Lonnie because I saw him play, and he uses everything. He doesn't leave anything out. You know, some guys put one setting. That's the setting you hear all night long. It's, you know, if they're into Larry Young, it's Larry Young's setting. And um, he didn't really use big, the big sound ever. But, uh, but like, I love Wild Bill. I love Don Patterson. And I love Dr. Lonnie. And I love Charles Erlen. So all of those sounds, that's what I wanted. That's why I didn't want to get in the arena, because I wanted to be free to do all that. You know, because sometimes guys get stuck in this thing of I have to find my voice and my voice is going to be just this thing right here. But like, that's so restricting, right. you know. So me, I just, yeah. you know what, I'm just doing any voice I want and I'm using it my way. But like, I want to utilize everything from the beginning of the organ history yeah. right till now. And even some of my own, you know, I've even found some of my own crazy sounds. And um, that's, that's the fun of it to me, switching sounds on this low tech kind of like a low tech early synthesizer, you know, where you could just get these crazy sounds and do crazy stuff with them. But, um, and, and so I feel like yeah. that's inspiring for me. And uh, yeah, I think that might be, no, I've done that before. I've done that before. I was gonna say, I think that might be the first time I ever did the explode on the 
ballad, but I've done it before on, on my other records too. But it came out especially well, and I love the sound in Rudy's. The, the, oh, the, the sound, the sound of that really organ full on the recording. Uh, it's thick. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's really fat. Yeah. Right, right. Is is it hard to um, play a new organ like one that you're not familiar with, um, as opposed to your own? Um, it can be strange. You know, some organs are stiffer than others. Right. Uh, some organs don't have enough bass, uh -huh. so or the Leslie might not work well. There's a lot of variables because it's electronic. Okay. So yeah, they're they're as different as night and day, and uh, so it gets. I don't think it's hard if the sound isn't right because right. so much of the music depends on you being full enough. You know, mm -hmm. so if the bass isn't full enough, the music suffers, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, you got to okay. grin and bear it because that's what it is, and there's no way to to, to boost it up. So. Yeah, it can be really a, a great experience, or it can be a really aggravating experience, okay. especially when they do these, they give you these keyboards nowadays, you know, you don't even know what it is, you don't know where the button, what the <laughs> right. buttons do or right. anything. You play the thing, so, yeah. Right. And the next tune is uh, Party Time. Yeah, the Lee Morgan. Yeah, that's, that really worked out nice. That was a per, that, well, I knew that Dennis had that because years ago, we did one gig at Smoke with the big band in Oregon. And he wrote that specifically for me for that gig, and so uh, I just said, "Pull, let's pull that out because that's a that's a winner. Yeah. That's a natural." Um, and you do some outside playing on this one, and then some. You know, it gets real bluesy again, and then um, you, you got some exciting trills in there, and then right at the end, then Fattis comes in with that big scream to, to the climax. So I thought this was a real exciting yeah. one. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, all that stuff, of course, is all just spontaneous and whatever happens happens but uh I, when i was listening to it back it really it really came out just as i would have hoped it would which is something i don't usually say when after i hear a record you know there's so many times when i'll say uh that one almost was right but you know a little off at this part but but that record i don't know it was it was one of the days i mean it sounds like you guys were rehearsing for a yeah. long time to get you know that cohesiveness yeah <laughs> we weren't but i think I think there's something about the pressure of seeing all those guys. Like you got to come through, you know, you got 17 guys sitting there and you know, like there's not going to be three, four takes where you take your time and you find just your right moment where you play your best solo. It's just like, no, right now do it. And that's, that's called professionalism, you know, where you can do that. If you can pull up that kind of, that kind of uh, headspace where you're like, no, just go for it, do all your stuff, do it now and get it done. And so, I feel like everybody kind of did that on that day, including the whole big band. I, I think so too. This this album has it's just got fantastic energy all the way through, and I guess I'm not surprised to hear it was recorded in a single day. So <laughs> yeah. it was just so all there. You just had the right vibe, right. right? Because if you had another day, you might say, "All right, let's try it this way this time. Let's try it this way this time." But this was right. like, no, let's just try it, do it, get it done. Yeah. <laughs> it's very immediate. It's one one of the strengths of the record, I think. Thank you. Yeah, then we've got uh, Bags and Brown. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really like how this this starts with the whole band swinging, but then you've got this like great kind of stop time organ part that alternates with the band. Right, that was Dennis's idea. And um, I think it worked out good. It was just the tune that I wrote that sounded to me like them because they were best buds. That's Milt Jackson and Ray Brown, in case people don't know who Bags and Brown are. But uh, they were best pals, and they had this kind of way of combining bebop with blues you know and they were just badasses i mean what else can you say so that tune's got kind of a badass yeah indeed. thing to it you know and it's it's got both the old and the new in it and um it's bluesy and soulful and yet it's bebop so that reminds me all of that is is what they were about so when i wrote it i thought man this sounds just like something bags and brown and ray brown would play and uh, I love the way it came out on the, on the record. This organ solo here is really inspired. I mean, it's filled with like these trills, but then the horn keeps like charging you up with these blasts. And so it's like, yeah. Right, they keep coming in. And that was kind of like old. I mean, I had told Dennis, I wanted to have a thing where I want to be interactive with the band. I don't want to just be like the, the guy's solo and there's no band, you know? I want it to be really, uh, uh, you know, tension release, like band coming in, I take off band comes in, I hit a high note, you know, all of these things that make an organ and big band record exciting. And he yeah, did. Yeah. I especially thought that tune, it, it, it's just like feeding the fire with uh, the horns on there. It was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
very successful in then that the, way. That's the next right. one was the surprise for me because uh, I said, I know this dude. And I thought, yeah. Yeah, I uh, did the same the, thing. Uh, I didn't know what it was, though. Um, <laughs> it's like, I've heard this before, yeah, uh, but biggest I can't place it. Me, yeah. right? This is uh, 1980 Ambrosia, right? That's exactly the feeling I like to uh, instill in people. They're like guessing, you know, like, wait a minute. What is this? Because it doesn't sound like that. No. Right, so right. At first, you're like, this is a nice tune. Wait a minute. Hold on. I know this melody. You know, that's exactly what I love. And then people come up to me and say, was that so-and-so? And I yeah, that's it. And I just, I, you know, I always liked that tune. And, uh, and I started playing it kind of fast with the organ band and realizing it's kind of pretty. And it's got a nice chord progression. I like those, sometimes those R&B tunes, they have like soul chord progressions that you blow. And, uh, and it's different than playing over standards or jazz tunes. And it's got a feeling that I like. You know, that's that's kind of the feeling I think of when I think of the organ. You know, I mean, organ can do anything. There's no limit to what it can do. But maybe if I had to say, I like, if there's one thing I really like the best about organ, is that to me, it's a soulful instrument and a blues instrument. You know, that's what it is just to me, that's my own opinion. But uh, just the sound of it is soulful, right? Because it comes out of church I mean, even with the big band, this is what I like about organ with big band is it kind of souls up the big band, you know, where, you know, big bands can be like pop, pop, da, 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 right? And, and it can be kind of pizzazzy, but you put the organ in there and then it's like, oh, it's soulful. It's a little bit more warmer. It's like it warms it up a bit, you know, and it makes it more fun and stuff. So all of those things come to mind when I, when I do both the big band and my quartet tunes. Uh, and so that tune there, yeah, I mean, I used to like that tune. You know where I got hip to it, though, that made me really want to do it, was listening to uh, Take Six do it. Have you ever heard their rendition of it? Oh, no, I haven't. That's what made me um, want to do it, because when I heard them do it, first I had the same reaction. I'm listening to them like, I know this tune. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that old tune. But the way they they sing it is so great, you know. And then I just made it swing, you know, but I said – I. That's where I heard the possibilities of the tune anyway. You take the melody for a, a real swing uh, before it goes into the solos. And then yeah. I could only you know pick it up from, because I knew the chord changes, because that tune was drilled into my head as a kid growing up on AM radio. You know, that was such a huge hit. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. It was the number one and, hit. Um, yeah. But, yeah, yeah. The, like you say, the um, the way it's arranged and then with the swing, it's... Uh, you know, it becomes a bit of like a, a challenge to identify it. But uh, yeah, I thought that was a really cool choice to, <laughs> to go on there. And then the right. the last tune, just the blues, blues for Jed. I take that's the original one too then, yeah. Yeah. Jed is, yeah, Jed is the gentleman who had the uh, grant, Jed Parodies. So I wrote him a little tune and we went in and recorded. And you know what? It's, it's a nice, it's a nice capper to the record, just a nice swinging blues. And it really was swinging, I think. It's, uh, you know, it's almost eight minutes. So everyone gets to play for a long time. Everyone gets to extend out on the solos. Right, there. right. It was, it, it was like, let me out of the closet yeah. just for a minute, you know, because right. the other tunes were like five minutes, six minutes. And uh, yeah, that was actually the second day we just went in and that was the first tune we played. Just like, let's get warm up tune, right. you know, and, uh, and it came out like that. We only did one take. That was it. Peter Bernstein does his usual, like very tasty guitar solo, but he's still got more time. So he starts doing some really cool strumming in his solo that I hadn't heard him do before. Chord, a chord solo. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Chord solo. I mean, I'm the one who tried to talk him into do that, you know, because he didn't do chord solos for years. And I was like, why don't you, why don't you just stop playing single notes and play some chord solo? He's like, well, I don't know. Yeah, it's like Wes Montgomery. I said, well, you know, that's okay. It's, and then he started doing it. He's doing the hell out of it. And, and he told me, he said, you know, I, I do like it. I said, well, do it then. It's because we so stuck in, in the pressure, you know, the pressure out here to be uh, your own voice and all of this stuff. It's like, man, just play. That's my, my attitude has always been. My only thing is I want to absorb the greatest cats I can and give that back. What I, what I like from them, I want to give that back to you, you know, and I want to put that into my audience. I want people who buy my records to enjoy that like I enjoy listening to the masters. And if I can do that, I'm keeping this music alive, the lineage. You know, I'm, I'm keeping the, the real the real stuff going so that if somebody is saying, well, you know, guys don't swing anymore, you know, or swing is irrelevant and uh, guys really can't swing. Really? All right, put on that record. Let's hear it. Tell me that record's not swinging. I mean, I don't mean to be bragging, but there's just no denying it. You know, you put on the record, you're going to say, wow, 
that is not only swinging, really swinging. You know? I mean, John Weber, one of the great bass players of this particular era, and nobody probably knows who the hell he is, but he is one of the top bass players in the entire world, and he swings on the top, top level. And Joe Farnsworth, one of the greatest drummers. You know, I mean, these are people who, who uh, might not have uh, the, the name recognition that other guys may have, but but they're, these are the top New York City guys, and they've been playing with me forever. And this is what we do here, you know, in New York City. We swing, and we keep all of this stuff happening at the highest level that we can reach, and we're always pushing that, pushing to get it higher. You know, that's swing is one of the main uh, things that we love. And when, when I hear people putting it down and saying it's, you know, uh, something from the past, that is just the most uh, irritating frustrating conversation and, and a lot of people get into that thing you know i even heard a thing recently where miles davis was like well you don't dress the same why would you play the same and you know that's i understand the that does kind of make sense you know when i heard him say it i thought well that is kind of true you know but thing is you can't really say dressing is like music you know <laughs> dressing is a, is a fashion you know music is an art music is an expression of your heart and soul big difference right there and if you don't, if your heart and soul is 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 dedicated to and, and and wrapped up in and identified by swing, why would you repress it? That's what Bags used to say to me when when cats were just starting to. You know, I was with Mill Jackson for twelve years and playing piano, of course. And um, you know, he used to say to me, "Why are guys repressing swing?" And I said, "I don't know. You know, it's become a thing. It's become a thing where people think you don't swing if you want to be new and different." You don't swing. You play in different odd time. I like all that. I have nothing against it. But uh, but I don't like when people that do that try to then uh, put down people who swing, which is what happens. You know, they, they they they're not happy just with the whole diversity of the music. It's always these little these little church groups who have their religion, and you believe my religion, or you're out. You know, and you're wrong too. You're wrong. I'm not wrong. You know, if this is what I'm about. Why can that, how can that be wrong? You know, this is, this is what Benny Golson told me. He said, um, how you play is who and what you are. That's it. If you're real, if you really get to the real deal. So if you avoid that, you're, 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 you're missing the point. I agree with you on the swing. I think it can never go away. This other album we're going to talk about, uh, uh, this is uh, Dmitry Baevsky. Uh, it's almost like mm -hmm. going back in time. It's, it's swing and bebop that's all really hard swinging. There's nothing that like what you hear on most, you know, new sax releases today, but it sounds so good. Right. He was a New York guy. He was here for years, you know, and he picked it up. And he, yeah. he, that's why he came and here. Recently, sure. we've been uh, looking at some Scandinavian jazz and we came across this, yes, yeah, Snorri Kirk, Snorri this Kirk, drummer. Right? <laughs> um, and he, he plays in... Uh, uh, Denmark, I think Denmark. He plays and in Denmark. Yeah. The things they're doing with swing there, it sounds like so fresh, uh, and you know, it's American music in a different place. That's good to hear. That's amazing to hear because for years Europeans weren't doing it, and in fact, they were the biggest um, denouncers of it. You know, like uh, there was a there was a kind of a movement where it was like America's had their day, and now we're the real jazz over here, which is that to me. That is the most racist. You cannot take African American music and say, now we have, we white people have taken it away from you. Sorry. No, you'll never do that. This is African American music and the rhythm of the music is that the core, at the core, now you don't have to stay there. If you really want to get brass tacks, is swing. Because no other music had swing, right? There's no other music that has that groove. And so, and it is not an easy, it is not an easy groove you get obviously because people can swing and there but there are different levels of swing right and you can hear guys and you can say yeah they sound really swinging but then you put on paul chambers went and kelly and blakey and you say oh my god they sound really swinging you know so there are different depths and levels of swing and uh it's a real human a real human thing to swing because there's no parts you know the big player doesn't have his little part and the drummer doesn't have his little part because if you put your little parts together, you can get a good R&B groove. And that's one thing. Everything's being improvised when you swing. So it's like everyone's doing their thing, and yet it's got to sound like the perfect little part that's... I mean, it's an insane thing to do, and that's where the art is, you know? 
It has to be. It has to be loose, and you have to play as one person and really listen to each other. It's a, it's a real group effort, and it takes selflessness. You have to just uh, uh, you know allow yourself to, to not think about how do I sound, how do I sound, but like how do we sound? You know, like if you watch Billy Higgins play, he always thought about how do we sound. How can I make this sound better? When you, you talk to Ron Carter, he's going to tell you he's trying to pick the right notes to make you sound good. You know, this this is the selfless act known as jazz music when it's done it is in the right way. If I had to, you know, from listening to all your piano music and uh, organ, I would to describe, you know, your style to me that that sort of swing and groove is the thread that runs through it. You know, regardless of if you're playing a ballad so. or <laughs> if you're doing these funky tunes, <laughs> that sense of, you know, the rhythm and and drive is always there. And I think that's why I always know when, I, when I'm going to put on one of your recordings, it, it's going to have some that rhythmic feeling that makes you feel good and draws you into the music. Oh, that's nice. Well, thanks. That's yeah. exactly what I want to do. There's a lot that's of music today that in jazz that's, you know, it's interesting and different and cerebral, but it doesn't, it doesn't grab you, you know, from down below and pull you into it. Right. Well, a friend of mine put it this way. He said, where's the joy in the music? There's a certain joy, a joyous feeling in swing and, and in hearing music that has rhythm like that. And other, other musics, if there's no joy in it, then it becomes a selfish, uh, indulgent kind of uh, look at me, look at me, look what I can do. I can do this thing. You know, aren't, aren't I great? But actually, that's not to me what jazz is about. Jazz is about giving, you know, and, and communicating with people and getting inside their hearts and their bodies and their minds, you know? So, so like, and that joy is what attracted me to the music, listening to Miles Davis and all the greats. They had that joy. And uh, it started with Louis Armstrong. So, you know, it's like, this is where uh, I, want, I want to do that. You know, I want, that's how I want to keep people connected to the swing, you know? It doesn't, it never becomes irrelevant because it's now. How can it be irrelevant when it's happening right now? That's just a ridiculous statement. All right. It's such an uplifting sound, too. And it seems to me that we could all use that right about now. So why would you want it to That's go? That's what away? I thought. You know, it's funny because yeah. this record was made so long ago. And I was really getting frustrated with how long it was waiting to come out. You know, I mean, I had been listening. Right. And it took over over a year for it to come out. And I'm I'm thinking, like, God, I really want people to hear this. But I'm glad that uh, the record company held it back because this is the time for it to come out. You know, now that we're coming out of this mess, at least in America, um, and Japan, I guess is Japan doing okay? Slow. It's slow. Um, everything yeah. changes slowly we're, here. So. We're doing yeah. okay, but everything is slow. Yeah, it's it's yeah. a very slow moving culture. Country. People are getting uh, vaccinated. It's starting. Yeah, senior just, citizens. They're just starting yeah. to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're I pretty, see. Okay. Yeah. Well, right. when you get further into the vaccination thing, you'll see it's going to die right down, and uh, and you start to feel like we can already go out without masks on, and uh, we're going. The clubs have completely opened up again. There's no. No restrictions on the capacity anymore. So things are really starting to pop. And it's a joyous feeling. And it's plus the weather's turning nice. So it's time for Groover Quartet plus Big So yeah. all of our listeners, <laughs> right. you got to get this album because it's going to make you feel really good. It's um, fantastic. Two final questions for you. Uh, any chance of hearing this combination live, Big Band and Groover Quartet? Ah, uh, you know, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I, I, it's a hell of an endeavor because it's so damn expensive. You know, but uh, I am trying to work on some things. Yes, uh, I might be able to do it in the States, but not in Japan. Well, who knows? Who knows? I mean, I might talk to those people at the Blue Note, see if they want to do that, or if there's some venue that I could come over there and do it. I'm sure they're going to love it. That would be cool. <laughs> yeah, Any? Uh, do you have any other projects in mind? Is there going to be another big band recording in the future? Or do you have uh, you no, go? not like that no. again. No, that not was a one-off, one huh? That's a, it might, it might happen again. Who knows? I may, you never say never, but no, I want to do something just uh, maybe a little different than that. That would be, uh, I'm thinking about something with some like percussion players and something going in another, oh, that would be good another direction. Yeah. I mean, every one of my, except for the first few Google records, I've tried to do something different on each one. They all swing, but uh, there's like, you know, Vincent Herring is on one, Jeremy Pelt is on one. Uh, you know, I tried to put different combinations that just make it different, maybe for a few tunes, you know? I would love to do something with a choir. That's something that I've had in the back of my mind because I listen to a lot of gospel music and I love choirs, you know, and it goes with the organ. So, and with piano, you know, God only knows what I'll do. 
there. But yeah, I got things. Things are percolating. <laughs> okay. Who have you been listening to lately? And uh, in, uh, in music, you know, when you're not when you you're not playing, believe, what do you listen you won't to? Believe who I've been listening to a lot lately. I've been going back, man. Well, I've been into a Bud Powell frenzy over the entire pandemic. And I was into Bud Powell when I was in college, real heavy. And then, I don't know, some reason for this pandemic, I've been going back and listening to him like crazy and getting a lot of the stuff that I missed back then, like some of his more abstract compositions. But also, like, I, I don't know why, but I've been listening to a lot of Johnny Hodges. I don't know why. All of a sudden, Johnny, you know, I, I got a new table. So um, I have a lot of vinyl records. And I've been playing all the old ones, you know, with Duke Ellington and, uh, and Johnny Hodges records with, that he made with Oregon. And boy... They are cooking. There's one with um, with uh, Oliver Nelson, big band, and uh, Leon Thomas. Do you ever hear that one? Three Shades of Blue. I have yeah, no. It's ridiculous. It's got Ron Carter and Grady Tate in the rhythm section with Johnny Hodge, and it's just burning, you know. So I'm, I got these records, and I'm just pulling out like older, older people. I, I mean, and I always keep listening to, you know, uh, Ahmad Jamal and McCoy Tyner. I mean, I listen to McCoy Tyner a lot and Herbie Hancock and stuff like that. But I'm a real. I've been into a real McCoy Tyner phase uh during this time it's been great i mean in a way i've had a lot of time off but i've also put my head into things that i didn't have time for before you know really indulging myself in just okay let me check this i've always wanted to know this what is this and plus you know like i've been checking out new guys like um gerald clayton you know i checked out gerald clayton playing in uh you know all the things you are like seven eight six and five and you know like i'm amazed by it and I say, this guy, wow, he's an amazing talent. And I know him. He's a sweet person. I know his dad. We just listened to uh, last week uh, a young French pianist, uh, Simon Chevalier. And uh, he's only about uh, 29 years old. And we were really amazed yeah, at uh, uh, taking, like, you know, French songs and really you know interesting that, time signatures the time. and really oh, yeah? effortlessly in such a young player. And um, yeah. yeah, so. Right, right. I mean, that, you, know, you got to live that, just like any music, I think, you got to live that music to get that loose within it. You know, that's still not where I live, you know. That's why I go in there and check it out. I'm like, okay, is it, let me open the door to this weird room and <laughs> look into it, put the light on. <laughs> okay, one more question. for uh, last. You said, so we're back at the beginning again. Last night you said you played uh, out last night, and we're recording on June 6th. 2021 so yeah. uh what was that oh, yeah. like to be out live oh, again it was wonderful it was a wonderful experience it was a little club out in um nyack new york which is about 40 minutes from manhattan called maureen's jazz cellar and the gentleman who owns it is a, is a jazz pianist i mean i called the guy i've never been out there it's been there for about five years i never even heard of it before but my friend joe farnsworth the drummer told me about it and you know i thought all right let me give the guy a call because obviously i'm not working much and wow, when he answered the phone, he was like, is this the real Mike Ladon? Oh, my God, will you play here? <laughs> I never got that before. So no, we said it too. <laughs> the reception was wonderful. Lots of people were there. They loved it. And, uh, and it just felt so good. Nice Steinway piano. And it just couldn't have been better. Today, I'm going to Philadelphia to play at a place called Chris's Jazz Cafe. So this is my big weekend. Two nights in a row. We're coming back. So I'm seeing the light end of the tunnel here you know i could see things are going to start to reemerge slowly uh, any, but surely a uh, piano project in the future for recording not right now no but i have i have stuff in mind but uh not a solid date you know because i think i'm thinking next i might do just a straight up groover date with some little thing thrown in you know but that's what i've been i've been writing some new arrangements and some new tunes for that and um put out another one of those because they're well they're so easy, you know, because I have the band playing every week. So we can, we don't have to rehearse. We just slowly let these tunes evolve. And that's why I think that those records, like you, you like the records and I'm glad and thank you for saying that. But I think that's why they come out good is because they're not contrived at all. They're right, not, right. Exactly. we're not like, I'm not thinking of a whole record's worth of repertoire and then one rehearsal and just cramming it all in and hoping it works. I mean, you know, a lot of those records are done in three and a half and four hours. We just go one take each, bam, 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 out. <laughs> so that's my kind of record date. I hate being in there for over six hours. And like, and by then you're so burned out. I am anyway. I, I just, uh, I'm. it's like beating uh, my head against the wall after a while. So with those group dates, we're just in, out, 
they're easy, and they come out good, and everyone likes them. So we can ask for more than that. <laughs> Thanks very much for taking the time for uh, talking with us today, Mike. And all of our listeners, get out there. And oh, yeah, I really appreciate it. Fabulous yeah. new big band and organ disc. It's all your fault. By yeah, this is a fantastic Mike record. Redone, the Groover mm -hmm. Quartet and big band, and you're going to have a good time. And uh, Mike, we hope that uh, for you and all the other musicians in New York and elsewhere, that uh, the gigs start uh, popping up more regularly, and uh, musicians can play, and all the fans can go and hear live music again. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, it's going to happen. It's already happened. But thank you. Thank you. It's nice to talk to you guys. And hopefully I'll be over there sometime, you know? Looking forward <laughs> to it, yeah. Okay, guys. Thank you.